I start with what we've already seen here. Eleanor Lundstrom was a dynamo, always. And though she was a political scientist, the Nobel Prize in Economics really didn't have a chance, after, not after she and we made clear through so many studies that institutional arrangements do matter and often exert huge influence on the productive economic activities that allow human communities to keep themselves going. I first met her in 1967, when I was a novice graduate student in political science, as she was just beginning her teaching career at Indiana University. She was struggling with her first year of teaching, but she worked at it and became, in the end, as many people here know, a person who shaped dozens and dozens of productive scholars focusing on common property problems, among other issues. In the office, in the field, at conferences, she was disciplined and indefatigable. At the first common property meetings at Annapolis, Maryland, in 1985, we organized the conference around Ron Okerson's paper on analyzing the commons of framework. The point of that article was to allow everyone at the conference to share a common language so that instead of stupidly trying to compare apples and oranges, we would be able to conduct meaningful discussions comparing elephants, irrigation systems, <coughs> birds' nests, soup swallows, and land tenure. It was a little messy to begin with, but it was a start. There's an old American saying meant to convey great seriousness of purpose and competitive drive. You may get up early, but we're up all night. At Annapolis, Lynn was up all night. She'd hunch over her computer with the paper delivered that day, struggling to devise a database that would capture the masses of information they contained. It was far too complicated to manage in a couple of nights, but she didn't give up. Twenty years later, Lynn and teams of common property specialists and methodologists, many of them her graduate students, had worked out databases for irrigation systems, groundwater, fisheries, and forests, the last being the International Forestry Resources and Institutions Database that many of you here may recognize as IFRI. The International Association for the Study of Common Property, today's IASC, had seen the light of day early in the, that 20-year period with the first meeting held at Meghna Keene's Duke University in 1989. She's a recidivist. We inaugurated Lynn Ostrom as our first president. A quarter of a century later, IASC is still going, evidenced by our presence here on Kita Fuji. The consulting firm I worked with eventually teamed with the Ostrom's Indiana workshop at Syracuse University on a foreign assistance program called Democracy, Finance, and Management, or DFM, that USAID organized. DFM had a mandate to conduct long-term applied research on common property and public good problems, particularly with regard to roads and irrigation systems. The general idea, this is from USAID, was to find out why so much money had been spent on massive roads and irrigation projects with so little to show for it. In that project, Lynn pushed again and again to highlight people's self-organizing capacities. Lynn and I went to Nepal early on in DFM, uh, around 1988, to explore irrigation and forestry problems in the country. We traveled down to Tarai, the flat part at the bottom of Nepal, to examine some farm-managed irrigation systems. Later, we traveled up into the Himalayas to find out more about the Nepal-Australian forestry project. Returning to Kathmandu, we agreed to take a Nepali politician who'd been visiting his district back to the capital. That's when I learned that Lynn also had, in addition to all her other admirable qualities, a sense of humor. We, two social scientists, thought we'd found the perfect individual, this politician, to pump for background information about forestry in Nepal. We were traveling with a Nepali forester, and we asked him to translate our first question for the politician assuming we'd quickly get an answer and then be able, through a back-and-forth exchange, to gather some valuable information. 
The first question, about two sentences long in English, and I guess about two sentences long in Nepali, unleashed an absolute torrent of sound from the politician in the front seat. He spoke as though he was addressing an open-air audience without a public address system. The Land Rover we were riding in literally shook with the power of his oratory. Lynn and I exchanged startled glances and waited for the man to finish. It took him 10 minutes. Then we asked our forester companion for a summary translation. He condensed the 10 minute torrent into two sentences. We suspected that we were possibly missing some of the fine detail, but thought we'd try a follow up question to seek more precision on a small point. We asked the forester translate, and the politician unleashed another 10 minute torrent. By this time, we started to suspect that he wasn't the rich information source that we'd imagined. Still, we decided to persist, and bravely, we thought, try to get a third question. When the politician's rhetoric began again, and it was clear that he launched himself for at least another 10 minutes, we couldn't contain ourselves and just collapsed into laughter in the back seat. The worst was we couldn't look at each other, because each time we did, we burst again into peals of laughter. We felt terribly embarrassed, but just could not stop laughing. The flow of noise from the front seat continued undiminished, however, <clears throat> so the politician probably didn't even hear us shrieking and giggling over his thunderous voice. And, as I think he probably intended, we learned nothing from him about forestry problems <laughs> in Nepal. As that DFM project continued, it lasted for seven years, it became harder and harder to talk with Lynn about project activities by telephone. I wasn't living in Indiana. She was by then serving as chairperson of the government department of Indiana, running a domestic research program on police studies, editing a new journal, and teaching several courses. Playing a lead role in DFM was a mere side activity, but not one that she neglected. Lynn proposed a solution for our communication problem. I was back then a fairly early riser. Lynn suggested that I should call her at home at 6 a.m. because that's when I was most likely to get through. So I did, and repeatedly as the months rolled by. She told me once that she got up at 4.30 a.m., had breakfast, and then settled down to work by 5 a.m. She worked with extreme efficiency. By the time she arrived at the department at Indiana University at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, she'd already completed what for others would be a full day's work. She'd then do a second day's work, teaching, working with graduate students on their research projects, administering a department, and the Bostrom's growing workshop in political theory and policy analysis, writing books and papers frequently on commons problems. Governing the commons stems from that era. She then returned home to cook supper and frequently entertain before turning in at 10 p.m. Lynn Ostrom was a dynamo and in the course of a single lifetime accomplished a huge amount for the practical benefit of people all over the world. <clears throat> we certainly haven't solved all the commons problems, but at least we now understand much more about them and what is required to solve them. And we now know that we now hear much less about the necessity of privatizing the commons to prevent tragedies. That is a signal achievement. It demonstrates the value of fine-tuning concepts, which Lynn insisted on always, in ways that align them more precisely with lived realities, so that people with interest and determination can leverage them as tools to help solve what are, after all, persistent commons problems at many different scales, from farm-managed irrigation.